Kendall Cow, 365 Sports College Basketball Analyst, joins us. There are actually two games among two top 25 teams, plus Baylor hosting TCU, Texas at top a 21st-ranked BYU, and Houston at home against Kansas State. Kendall, is it one of those where, uh, you know, in, in the days of football, they used to have that drill where you'd get in the middle, the bull ring or whatever, and everywhere you looked, you got hit with a, a pad or somebody tackling you. Is that what it's like to describe the Big 12 night in and night out? I think absolutely, Smokey. Uh, KU probably, by most estimates, almost every season is predicted to win the league. They go to UCF. They lose. Who's the team predicted to finish last to start the season? West Virginia, 13th in the Big 12 by most analytics ratings and by most predictive ratings entering the season. What happens? KU goes there and loses as well. Other than Oklahoma State, all 13 teams I think can legitimately say right now, if things break right, we can make the NCAA tournament. And when there were 10 teams, we talk about, well, if there are eight that can make it, that's such a deep league. Now with 13 out of 14, I don't know if the top of the Big 12 is as good as it's been in some of its heydays, like in 2020, when Baylor and KU were battling as some of the top two teams in the country and that magnificent Saturday game right before COVID into the season. But I think 1-13 to in the league is so phenomenal this season. It would match up very well with 1-10 to any other season prior. Kendall, Baylor's lost two road games in a row, one at the buzzer, one in double overtime. Is there something wrong with them that's different than before, or is that something maybe not to panic about until we see them at home against TCU tomorrow? Yep. Uh, Paul, I think this season, when Baylor's good, it's very good, and when it's bad, it's very bad. And I think the bad becomes very bad. That margin of error is much worse than it's been in the past. The contrast between how Baylor lost those two games last week, I was in Manhattan, and I couldn't remember seeing Baylor shoot so poorly in any game. And you can look at that game and say, it seemed like K-State got a little lucky with how poorly Baylor shot. I think that's true. What I also think is true is that Baylor does not have the capacity when it's playing its B or C game to just come in and win anymore because they're liable to make some of the mistakes you wouldn't like to see. In that K-State game, Josh Ocean Luna gets off by a rotation, suddenly fouls Arthur Kaluma in overtime, Baylor doesn't get a chance to win the game at the end. Texas game, Baylor played sloppy defense, but the effort running around screens was bad. And then suddenly you look back and you give yourself an opportunity to have somebody make a layup on Langston Love to end the game. So I think the difference with this year's Baylor squad is the bad moments have been so bad, they've overwhelmed the good moments. Whereas in past years, Davion Mitchell, you know, will go out and get you a steal of possession later. Or Adam Flagler is going to hit two crazy threes so he can make up the distance. Baylor's not a make up the distance team like it's been in the past. With, I guess, close to 20 games played now at this point, Kendall, and getting halfway into conference play, how have your expectations or what you thought would kind of play out with this team, how has that changed, if at all, so far? I think, Craig, my expectation would be that Baylor ceiling might be a tick lower than I thought. I still think there's not necessarily a dominant team other than maybe Houston out there, and they open Big 12 play with two losses, which shows that the Cougars are certainly vulnerable as well. I think the ceiling's a little bit lower than I thought, but still, other than the debacle against Michigan State, Baylor's been in every game this season, and I think the ability for Baylor to stay in games will be there. It'll be a question of how good can Ray J. Dennis be down the stretch, and can he elevate his play from where it was this past week? You know, Kendall, I was at the game against Cincinnati, and I've watched them. I, you know, like you said, that they can be either really, really good or really, really bad. I, I don't get a read on them at all, and of course, that's not something that I'm an expert at anyway, but uh, it it just seems like they're just hit and miss. Is there is is it a rotational thing that Scott's still working on? I think there's something to the rotations need to be either tightened up or Baylor needs to make a different decision in some respects, Smokey. But I do agree with your comment about kind of what is Baylor's identity. And if you look at who they are defensively in particular, Baylor ranks between 120th and 150th in field goal defense, turning opponents over, defensive rebounding and free throw rate and the optimist could say well isn't that nice Baylor's not bad at anything but the pessimist could look at that and say well what's the identity of this team if you're at the end of the game and you need to stop and you're a team that dominates defensive rebounding you can say if we get one stop we know we're getting the ball back or if you're a team that forces turnovers you can say we're gonna go out and take something or if you're a great defensive team you can say they're not gonna get a good shot the problem for Baylor I think is they need to try and excel in one of these categories and take a risk they'll take a step back in one and the one I might look at is I think Baylor needs to be more aggressive, try and generate more turnovers with the length they have, and not just settle for we're okay in everything, and the end result become if you're mediocre in everything, you're not going to be more than a mediocre team, 
in that second game of the NCAA tournament. Kendall, um, when, with that identity, you know, that they, they match these things every year. Everybody does it through the transfer portal. Did they not – are they just like 10 degrees off on the match for all the guys that they have there? I think there is something, Paul, to not everyone lines up perfectly. And this is the challenge. You look across the sport. KU is either the worst it's been other than maybe that season that got blown out by USC a few years back. This is probably one of the two or three worst Bill Self teams in his tenure. What happens? He has to bring in a lot of transfer guys, and even worse for KU, they bring in Arturio Morris, who now isn't even on the team and is facing his own legal repercussions off the court. I think the challenge with the transfer portal, even in football, I think this was seen to some degree that in an era where there weren't so many transfers, it might have been tougher for Michigan to line up and have the dominance it had on both sides of the line of scrimmage. So I think the transfers make it harder to say every season you're going to be a top five team, which is where Baylor might have been trending if it could get the two or three year guys. But even somebody like LJ Cryer, who was so dominant at Baylor his last season, can look around and say, well, why didn't I play my first two years in transfer? So building teams like Baylor had built for the championship run, like KU had built in its most successful era, is maybe not as stable as a pathway. And so I do think there'll be more variance among Baylor's not going to drop down to where it was at times in 2011. But the idea that either Baylor, KU, or anyone else is always going to be a top five team year in and year out may not be as possible as it was five or ten years ago. Kendall, among all these these new faces, what have been your thoughts on a couple of those high-profile freshmen and Jacoby Walter and also uh, Eves Missy? I think Jacoby Walter has been excellent uh, his, on offense, but his defense certainly needs to improve. His lateral quickness is probably what's going to keep him out of the top five in the NBA draft, where he might have been trending that way. And what, by most analysts' expectations, is a pretty weak draft. I think Eves Missy's blown away expectations. Great on putbacks, can defend well. I think he's also defended well on the perimeter. So those two guys have done well. I think in the last week, Jaden Nunn played his best basketball week at Baylor. He's asked to guard the primary ball handler for teams, did well there. And I thought he showed more of a willingness against Texas to shoot threes. So that was exceptional for Baylor, where it looked like maybe he was trending out of the rotation. I thought Ray J. Dennis, though, had his worst week as a Bear. And he has to step up this week. I mean, two points against Texas, not good enough. He has, I think, what, two of 11 from the field or something like that against mm-hmm. K-State. Not a good enough week for Ray J. Dennis. As Baylor's offense tends to go as the point guard goes. And so he has to play at a higher level if Baylor wants to think it can compete with Houston and whoever else emerges from the pack of those middling teams. And when I say middling, it's not a bad place to be in the Big 12. But if you want to clearly contend with Houston and be in that 1-2-3 range, you've got to get better point guard play than Baylor got last week. Has Jacoby Walter, speaking of him, has he actually shown that he's a one-and-done? I think he has, Smokey, because potential is so important. The way he runs off of screens is elite. The way he can make catch-and-shoot jumpers, I think, is really valuable in the NBA. And his offensive efficiency is taken off there. I think the difficulties he has defensively aren't going to manifest as much. Deontay George is kind of in that rare position where other than his last week's struggles, he's been a better NBA player than college player Mm -hmm. because he's not asked to do as much defensively as Jacoby was asked to do this season and Keontae was last year, but certainly agree with the sentiment that Jacoby Walter has real flaws defensively, and that would make him concerning if you were saying, hey, is he going to be the number one or two option on a team? But you know you can bring Jacoby in as a guy who can make 15 or 18 points a game, hitting threes, and then you hope by the time he's 23, 24, he's a better defender. By the way, TCU has three losses in the conference. They lost by two at Kansas in a game where they might have gotten screwed on a call. Right, Paul? Sure. Uh, <laughs> no comment. Cincinnati by four on the road and then lost in a hell of a game at home by one to Iowa State. I think they're dangerous. And they can – they can. And I know Baylor's offense can score, but this is a team that can jump on you pretty quickly if you're not careful. There's zero doubt, Smokey, that TCU could win this game. Emmanuel Miller's been around forever and has been an excellent player. Avery Anderson from back in the Oklahoma State days is now in Fort Worth. And you look at maybe if you're TCU and you've lost some close ball games, I think two things stick out there. One, uh, TCU played an embarrassing non-conference schedule. I mean, you look at it, this is embarrassing. Jamie Dixon's squad's way too talented to play it. The flip side of that is that because they played such a bad schedule, I think it's easy once you play a team with a pulse, kind of like where Baylor, I thought, ended up after not having played the toughest teams in the early part of the non-conference, and you suddenly face Michigan State, and you wonder – you know, why do these guys move a little better than some of the teams we've played? But Baylor obviously challenged themselves a lot more than TCU. The two concerns I'd have for Baylor against the Horn Frogs this week in Smokey are first that I think Jameer Nelson Jr. is a better shooter than he's been. And the second would be that TCU played such a weak non-conference schedule that I think it's taken them a minute to get to where they could be. But beating Houston, 
having all those close games you mentioned are why TCU is a legitimate threat and why it wouldn't shock me if they finished in the top three in the league. Jameer Nelson Jr., I'm getting so old, Kendall. <laughs> oh, I feel old about oh, that, too. Are you Jameer serious? Nelson Jr. Did, yeah. I, did that skip by me? I did like, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, yeah, but it's just it's funny to think about just how time flies by. Kendall, of the newcomers, we all expected Houston was going to be able to jump and get into the mix pretty quickly, and they, they'd take a, a few more losses than they typically would in American play, but has anything in particular stood out to you from – the four new schools, not necessarily a rundown unless you want to do that, but has anything, I guess, come to top of mind when you think of just the four newcomers and their entry into the league so far? Yep, obviously, Craig, you could talk about how great Houston is. Analytically, they're running away from the field right now, but I think UCF being a team that's competent and has a pulse has probably surprised people. At times in the non-con, it seemed like this team was going to easily finish last in the league, but as mentioned, wins over KU, a win over Texas that caused that Rodney Terry, whatever's going on with him there. Other than Houston blowing him out and K-State kind of putting the hurt on them, they've been competitive in just about every game this season. Uh, I think that's a team that has a real shot to make the NCAA tournament, and that might be a situation where the rising tide of Big 12 competition lifted that boat. Uh, Kendall, I want to go back a couple of seconds ago. Uh, Smokey mentioned the Kansas thing. You're an attorney. Um, what, how do I uh... – answer those questions when I'm uh, boxed into a corner between my co-host and my wife uh, so where I can keep it, uh, you know, sounding legally Amanda, smart. Amanda, his wife is a KU fan, and Paul's <laughs> petrified to say anything that's true even, uh, about them, even if it's true. You, you don't have to go home to her, so <laughs> she has my uh, number. And my, that's very first. My fiance uh, is a KU grad for both undergrad and law school. What is going on KU fan. <laughs> I, I, know, I know the Jayhawks are everywhere now. What can we do? Yeah. So uh, you didn't guess, yeah, well, answer it for me. You have to deal with it too then. Yep, I think uh, for everybody, what I would say is you just credit KU where they're good, and if they're doing something poorly, you just say, well, you know Bill Self, anything could always turn around, and what could he do there? And then you mention, well, this team's a lot worse than past KU teams for all, this, all these reasons, and doesn't it really make you miss Devontae Graham? And the thing about KU fans is they love to talk about their past guys, so you just say, yeah, you know, this team's missing a Devontae Graham or a Joel Embiid. And they'll wax about those people, and they'll forget, oh, yeah, you just insulted my team. So it's one compliment kind of peanut buttered around the insults, and it seems to work out. But uh, what do I know? Maybe the KU fans will attack me later on anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kendall. I appreciate it. By the way, Devontae Graham, her favorite all-time. Uh, you, you were the one that offended the entire Oklahoma fan base, weren't it? Was it you that did that? It was. Oh, sm Smokey, no <laughs> doubt about that. Uh, I know OU's ecstatic to go to the SEC thinking – you know, things are going to turn around for Oklahoma, but uh, I remain steadfast that Oklahoma did not win the Big 12 this season. And if they go three more years not winning the Big 12, somebody owes $1,000 to charity. Mm. I'll find them on Twitter, but um, I'm not going to insult the OU fan base any more than what the SEC, I think, is going to insult them before too long. Wait, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. As an Oklahoma fan, I'm totally fine with what he's saying because I partially agree with him, actually, yeah. in, in some ways. But what's the, what's the bet again, just for a reminder? It was OU will not win a... Big 12 for SEC title in the next five seasons. We're now oh. two seasons into that bet, so they got to win the SEC in the next three seasons, Oof. which, you know, would seem very tough to me given Georgia still exists, but yeah. um, maybe it could happen. I certainly think Aggie's on the downslope. Um, so you still feel those Aggie recruits maybe – Things can get going for Venables down in Norman. Well, I think your odds have increased dramatically after this past season because if you were banking on them winning, like it would have been these last couple of years in the Big yeah. 12 was the easiest path. And now, yeah, like who the heck knows how that's going to occur. So, yeah, just If we get a power poll of the SEC as of what we know today, where would they be among the 16? Like seven, six? Somewhere, in, I think, I mean, I, Oklahoma's five and, Oklahoma. We, uh, but at highest, like five, maybe? Would they be ahead of Georgia? No. no. Texas. No. no. L.A. No. Uh, uh, b -b 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 Ole Miss. No. Not right now. Not I think that's where we kind of start yeah. to – we don't really know enough about area. them. Yeah, I, but I think Texas no and Alabama no, but they just beat Texas last year. So, you know, there's, yeah, there's that. They're... Georgia's the one we can say definitively. They are not better than Georgia. But besides that, I mean, it is Oklahoma, but, I mean, winning the SEC is a, a pretty tall task. It's, so yeah, we'll it, see how that goes. It wasn't easy for them recently to win the Big 12. So much less to, now with the SEC, they're in it also with Texas loaded up. It seems like it's just the right time. All right, Kendall. Thank you, sir. Kendall Cout covers uh, men's basketball, 365 sports, and also Sikkim 365.com.